So uh, thank you very much for staying tuned to the NTA. My name is Cecil Egbele, and you're watching The Medley Show with me, Cecil. Last week on the program was quite an interesting time. We talked about depression. You know, mental health is wide, but we try to focus on depression. It was quite an interesting discourse. You had a lot of questions to ask. Do you have any concerns? Many of you actually shared your opinions, your views, your thoughts on how you think um, others can learn from you and get to manage their mental health and also that uh, taking care of others. It was quite an insightful time. Right after the program, I had loads of messages and many of you asking that, please, you would like your questions answered. You would like to hear this topic again. Let's talk about it again. So I thought, okay, it's a good idea. Let's um, bring it back. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about depression. Depression is going to be the focus once again this week on the medley show. Last week on the program, I had the mental health physician, Dr. Shoaib Dayab, on set with us. Also, we brought uh, a caregiver, Michaela. She also um, shared with us what it takes to be a caregiver for um, to those with um, mental health challenges. And also, of course, completing our number last week is a Nollywood um, actor. I'm talking about Mufet Duncan. He was here to throw light on her on mental health challenges, especially depression in their industry and of course we talked about how you the fans of these celebrities tend to poke them a little and try to put them into some depressing state uh, we thought you know we should find ways of trying to cheer them up and encourage them remember the death of um Adame, you know that was part of what the thrust of our discourse last week well it's quite a, it was quite an interesting one like i said so we just decided to put this um little together for you to have a feel of uh, what how last week went. All right, this is a feel of how we had the show last week, and then we'll get back to take on your questions from last week. Depression, in particular, has been the term has been overused mm. to the extent that it has been watered down. People don't see it as a serious condition. Absolutely. Interestingly, is the commonest mental health condition. For me, um, dealing with it was, was difficult. Um, I remember that I added so much weight. You know, I let myself go. Um, yeah. I didn't really post much about it because I didn't, I didn't feel like people really cared. You know, they all want the bad story. They want to know why your marriage failed. They want to know yes. what you did. Did you cheat on your wife? Did you beat your wife? And it's always the man that is at fault. Always the man that's at fault. The social media as well makes and breaks. It's a, it, makes, it makes you a celebrity and it also breaks you because, yeah, that's the same platform that everybody hails. You hail king of the Jews, and the next moment, yeah. they're asking, shouting, crucify him. I think social media is not helping, but is not the problem that we have. It just makes things worse. So I took a break, almost three, four months. I just went to social media, went to online, went to everything, and it took it took friends and family to pull me out of that. But I don't talk about it because I'm like, it's nobody's business. You know, people don't. They don't care. Online social media, people don't really care. If you have a parent who has had this depression, it increases your chances of coming down with it. It doesn't mean yeah. you have it. Uh, no. A parent had it, you will. Mm -mm. Yeah, it increases true. your chances. If you have a sibling that has had the depression, it further increases your chance, the percentage. And if you have a twin that has had depression, the percentage rises to up to like 60 oh, wow. percent so these are the predisposing factors so um divorce yeah. um loss of a loved one loss of a job sometimes yeah. relocation yeah. sometimes you know just changing your environment and, and sometimes it's actually the scripts that we do i'll, I'll give you an example oh, really absolutely yes um, um i never really cried i never really cried deeply until i shot a film and in the film um, it was called Lion in State, and my character, his wife had passed away, and she was so beautiful, so I buried her immediately. But then Frederick Leonard's character had come and touched her, said, ah, this baby's still alive, yeah. and gone to dig up her body. So months later, he then brought my wife back to me and said, ah, your wife was not dead, here's your wife. And I was shooting that scene, and I had to give my wife back to Freddie, and it, it brought something that I, I didn't even know existed. You know, I, I just I just broke down and they shot the scene like that with me crying, but I couldn't function for like a whole day after that. 
Wow. Yeah, so I had to, I to have to give me a break just to go off because I'm like, it brought out a beast that I've been holding for so long. So that script just took me out. Nobody could really understand. I'm like, guys, I don't know why I'm crying, but you guys, you know, like, mm-hmm. I just got to go home, you know. The fact that Cecile is able to stand people throwing jabs at her does not mean I have to be like her. Absolutely. If I know that it hits me and it puts me in a bad mental space, then I protect myself from it. One person can have more than one, more more than than one, one. mental illness. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so it okay. always, it, it would sometimes seem as though the symptoms are overlapping. Some people actually attempt suicide without the intention of actually completing it just to get attention. Mm. The um, schizophrenic people who we see on the streets who seem to live outside, who are most of the time homeless, they are not on any medication. Mm. They're not just, receiving just, any you know, treatment. They, you know, they're just not they're just accessing just... treatment. Now that's just a recap, a summary of um, how the last episode of this program went down today. We are back on to answer as many of your questions as possible. And like I said, uh, we have a lot of questions last week. I've put together many of these questions, or a few of them. I put them into different categories so we can answer as many of your questions as, possi- or as, as possible. Yes, even though we still expect you to send in more questions this week on our phone line, 81 one double seven eight twenty twenty. Uh, I would appreciate if you listen to the conversation. So, if we have answered your question in the course of the discourse, you wouldn't need to have actually send the question again. Do I know there are many of you who have depression worries? Do you want to share uh, questions? You want to make it very short and simple. All right, let's get to meet our mental health physician, Dr. Tayaba Shoaib. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. I like your outfits. Thank you very much. Yellow. Okay, we'll talk about colors later. I believe, I want to believe colors have to do with our, it helps our mental health or our depressed state sometimes. All right, so it was an, a good time last week. Thank, Thank you very you. much for Thank coming you. around. Thank and you. I know you've well. taken time to come today and it's a big deal to us. Now, um, let's, I group these questions into some categories. Now, let's start with uh, a couple of people asked questions about being depressed after the loss of a partner a wife a husband or a child you know the loss of someone sometimes they feel guilty many of them are yet to come out of it some of them is still a year a year ago many of them is still for a long time they still feel depressed how can this be managed i mean how can i how can we snap out snap out of it the person is dead is sad or we need to move on okay thank you very much um last week you know i talked about you know, when I was talking about the four Ps, I talked about things that predispose us to these illnesses and things that predispose us to the illness. That's depression, isn't it? Mm. So the person, two people can lose someone, but, you know, manage it differently. Mm. So it, it's not as simplistic as one person is weak and the other person is strong. Genetic makeup, you know, makeup is different. Mm. So our genetics forms up to like 50% of what happens to us. How we're created, you know, that's, you know, t- uh, in simplistic terms, let's just look at genetics like that. That's how our constitution as human beings by virtue of creation. So the precipitating factor now is the loss that we're talking about. Yes. So that's the factor that actually pulls the trigger to kickstart the process of persistent sadness. Naturally, if we lose someone, we feel sad. Sadness when, when we lose someone is not the same as depression. So before we say someone is depressed, that feeling of sadness has to be persistent. Do you understand? So it has to be persistent. So how do we say it is persistent? It is present for most part of the day, every day, for at least two weeks. Remember we also agreed that many of these people who are depressed are not, uh, it seeming to be the happiest in gatherings. Yeah, so good. So that's why, you know, you actually need a professional to diagnose to you know to diagnose the depression otherwise people will be given labels which is what we don't want you know so there's a criteria we have a diagnostic manual you know with a guideline to say okay the reason why i say this person has clinical depression is because they meet criteria a b c d right and you know just for understanding you need to understand yourself have you been feeling persistently sad? Has your mood been persistently low? For most part of the day, every day, for at least two weeks. 
with loss of interest in activities that you previously used to enjoy, withdrawing to self, so you're avoiding, you know, mingling with people, you're feeling hopeless, you know, you're feeling worthless, like people around you are better than you, and mm. in some severe cases, you know, feeling suicidal. So the events that happen to us can actually kickstart that process. So how do we help? When you start feeling, sometimes from the point, we don't necessarily have to wait to see if the sadness can be persistent, will be persistent or not. Mm. So at the point where I lose someone, I reserve the right to say, you know what, I want to get support from beginning. You know, because there are different forms of therapy. I can go in for grief counseling from the moment of the loss. So this could actually prevent me from eventually going into depression because I'm taught how to you know, manage it, how to process grief, mm. you know. And the thing is, people always tell us, snap out of it. And they tend to compare with other people, you know, to say things like, oh, this person lost three people on the same day. You just lost one. Mm. You know, it's not a fair statement to make because people are different. Do you understand? Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So people are different. So people handle this differently. Yeah. Um, let's take uh, a few questions here. Yeah, my depression is from my parents, and it's really affecting my relationship with them. So I've moved to Portacourt in this guise that I got a job there just to clear my head. So sometimes this depression comes from those that uh, are close to you, those that you love. Maybe we could also, um, maybe in this person's case, like some other messages we saw, someone is not married or so there's this whole nagging on societal his hair yes and every, so much so much expectation for society family and all so that could be a depression you could not just be in this case in instances of from love of people that you think should care yeah so sometimes you know you get you hear things from some of our patients saying that i know they love me but the love is stifling you know it's just too much mm. so having conversations you know to say for people to understand that our, how we interact with people, you know, affects people. So it's like the, the you know, the what they say about the axe and the tree. So I could just throw jabs at you and I think it's okay, I'm just joking. You're the one receiving it. Mm. And if the person says, I don't like it when you joke this way, I, I, I should respect that. Because it might seem a joke to me, but, you know, it's, it's repeatedly you know yeah, create it's assaulting it's your brain is repeatedly injuring you in a certain way and after a while people cope handle things differently Do okay quick, how, how can the person being being jabbed at or being spoken to yeah how can the person communicate to say please this I is actually like hurting this. me so i, I mean you as, know sometimes yeah. to african parents i mean you don't talk back i am telling you this thing there is there's no point to respond don't respond you are just you know good so I'm, I'm hoping that the African parents are listening, listening to us right now because it's a learning process, isn't it? Mm. And people change. You hear things like, because you still have people that don't believe there's depression. So they yeah. tell you things like, this very sensitive uh, generation, this very um, yeah. English generation, this know very, you time. know, what's depression? There's nothing like that. You know, sometimes they even tell you things like, when I hit the depression out of your head, you know, you feel, you feel better. So I think anyone listening to us right now should know that how we talk to people, things we say to people, you know, go a long way to affect them mentally, especially children. Because what, you know, what we call adverse childhood experiences affect children later in life. When you call children name, names, when, you know, things that we grew up with and they seemed to be, we, we seem to be okay with it, there's some people that, that are still not okay with it. You know, you call a child coconut head, look at your peers. You know, mm. do they have two heads today? We undermine whatever, you know, little good people achieve. Yeah, achieve. We should learn to affirm people. There was actually a study that showed pictures of people, you know, so they took pictures of people before and after they were told, oh, you look beautiful, you have a beautiful smile. And there was mm. like a world of difference. So they took pictures of those people and after they said, oh, you have a beautiful smile. The smile was different, so you could see the picture before and after. So positive words, you know, positive affirmations, affirmations yes, help us. Uh, so uh, I think that's a, a love language thing, you know. Is, is yeah, that's, that's a, a bit different. That's, a that's bit how different. people perceive, you know, understand love. 
the love languages. So some people are verbal, some people is acts of service, yes. some people is subtle touch, mm. you know, things like that. Okay, so. um, this person, hi, ever since my lady left me with her kids, I got into drugs, now I'm stuck, I, I'm stuck, I barely even have a shower. Please help, I know I'm depressed and broke. I'm not suicidal, but I wish I was dead. My name is Dodo. Um, all right, so Dodo, you take this question. We'll do it very quickly, our phone line once again, for text messages and WhatsApp only is 081-177-82020. Do you have questions you want answered? Uh, if your questions have been answered already, please just listen. The number is shown on, on your screen. Would I would expect your contributions on the program. So, uh, Dr. Dayab, what do you think? Okay, yeah. So, this is an interesting case, you know, um, like Dudu shared. A lot of people use substances to cope with their mood issues. Quite a number of people do that. So, and then it becomes a vicious cycle because substances can tilt people to depression and depression can lead people to start using substances because they're trying to lift their mood. Mm. Do you understand? So it's, an, it's a maladaptive way of coping. It's not the best way to manage your depression. Mm. So he says he's not suicidal, but he wishes he yes. were dead. So it's, you know, there's something, it's, it's a suicidal ideation, it's a suicidal thought. Do you understand? So thinking about being dead is a, you know, is a suicidal thought. But whether he's making plans about committing suicide is a different thing. So it's like a continuum. It's like a ladder. So initially people will tell you, I just wish, I think I'm better off dead. So it's like, you know, uh, the person is preoccupied with thoughts of dying because they feel hopeless. Like the, that's the only way out. So without, the, without appropriate help, it can you know, progress to someone actually thinking more about suicide or ending it all. So Dodo needs a lot of support. He needs a lot of professional help to tackle both now. So because it's looking like there's depression and then now there's substance use, hmm. you know, and it can continue to just, you know, move in that vicious cycle. All right, so let's pause our discussion for a while. I still have a few more of these uh, messages from last week we'll take. Um, very quickly, we had a chat with um, some who had passed through some form of depression. They shared their stories with us, and we thought, okay, let's share it with you. You might be able to, you might be able to learn a thing or two. All right, let's have a look at it. Point where it felt like everything I was achieving and everything I, w I felt was good was not good enough. I I constantly felt sad on days when I had big wins, on days when I should have been excited about whatever was happening in my life. But there was just that feeling of, oh, am I good enough? Am I doing enough? Am I where I'm supposed to be? So at that point, I felt like, oh, I need to speak up about whatever I'm feeling. I don't think this is the right response to how my life should be. I learned to channel my thoughts positively, you know, oh. because what you what you think you become so the more you're thinking oh am i declining am i in a state of retrogression you're not moving forward so at that point i learned to be careful of what i'm listening to what i'm allowing into my spirit and then what i'm speaking over myself so that particular morning they came in with smoke and um after hitting that particular blunt that day it felt different I felt different. I could not recognize myself. I, I really, I felt like something had happened to me psychologically. I, it happened that I started, to, I started to have funny symptoms. It felt like I was the only person existing in the world. At the time, it felt like everybody else was existing and I wasn't existing. It was a very complicated uh, situation for me. I had to go for psychiatric treatment a couple of times. Um, but here's what worked for me. I started to tell people the story, and that's how gradually I could see myself recovering. I could easily meet anybody and say, wow, this is what I experienced so, so time. And we'll laugh about it. Like, we'll laugh about it. You know, guys, normally, we laugh about it. And so I found that it was working, actually. I could relate to people about my situation. They would give me an advice, or they would laugh at me. But all the same, it was working out for me. My depression was, was due to... Um, for financial reasons and certain times in my life when things were so rough and turbulent and so and because of my reserved nature 
I couldn't share with people what I was going through. And because of the way I was raised, I, I was raised, I practically raised myself. And so it was difficult for me to just walk up to someone and say, okay, this is what I'm going through. And so that led to depression. And at some point I was, suicidal thoughts was, were coming in and I almost did it. With the help and intervention of God, I got someone who just came in out of nowhere and just feel, hey, guy, you're going through something. I could sense it on you. And so the person decided to just, you know, offer a counsel. Hey, young man, why don't you just um, talk to some people who could just, you know, help you with certain counsel or probably assist you with certain things. And I took it. I discussed with people, with, with um, one or two persons I feel I could trust. Because depression in itself, if you can't, to come out of it, you need someone you can trust before you can. I can't just put my mouth and meet you because you're my family member and say, I'm depressed, I'm going through this. Because you also, the person you want to talk to may be going through, and there's nothing as frustrating as you being in a challenge and then going to approach someone to help you, and the person is also probably going through worse. Okay, um, three individuals, three different stories. One had uh, kind of anxiety, uh, caused anxiety, depression. depression, right? Financial, then another drug. Yes. Just, yeah. yeah. On that I had a uh, drug related, you know. Sometimes, like uh, like we we talked about, sometimes some people are depressed for various of other reasons, but they go into substance to help suppress it. Yeah. So getting to manage this, can you want to react quickly to any one of this? Okay. Yeah. So like I said, different things can actually pull the trigger. So these are from what we've just heard or watched. You know, mm. they are all environmental factors. Mm. You know that triggered the depression so the first person felt worthless because she felt she wasn't doing as well mm -hmm. you know uh, compared to her colleagues it could be the depression that made her start comparing herself because one mm -hmm. of the core features of depression is a feeling of worthlessness so you start to feel like every other person is luckier than you every other person yeah. is better than you and you start to feel you know lower so it's one of the reasons again that people tend to withdraw from people because they feel i'm not good enough they worry about how they look, they worry about a body image, you know, it's part of depression. Body shaming, mm -hmm. it's true, mm -hmm. that's another one, yeah. that's another so one. I, because again, depression could actually lead to change in appetite. For some people, it suppresses the appetite, for some people, it increases the appetite. So what happens to your weight is a factor of in which way, which way it swings. So mm. some people you just find them comfort eating, eating all the time and they blow up. Yeah. So someone is already feeling low and then the person goes out and you say things like, you've gained so much weight. Huh. It could just tilt the scale or, you know, tip the boat and that could make the difference between someone, you know, being able, having the courage or someone in the courage to seek help or just ending it all. Okay, now you talk about um, environmental factors. Maybe mm. uh, let's touch very quickly on some people wrote about loss of livelihood i think mm. that could be environment economic yeah. environmental factor mm. and of course we know the times we are in and people are struggling mm. then another is talking about okay i think that same person also talked about a cheating wife okay i think he's lost his livelihood he had a cheating, wife, a cheating wife and he's just in a terrible situation so that's one uh, we've talked about parents uh, derogatory statements on their children then, okay, you take that one, and you now take about talk, talk about some other persons who say having a sexual partner is the only thing that keeps them sane. Okay, yeah. So, you know, the, let's talk about the person who lost their means of livelihood and then had found out that the partner was cheating. cheating. So it's a lot of assaults. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? So the person already feels not good enough because their means of livelihood has been cut off. So they already the person. Okay, just imagine all of us, you know, in this space right now, being broke. It has you of making us feel <coughs> low, isn't no, it? All of us are broke together, so everybody yeah, wants to understand. <laughs> but individually, okay. we feel sad. We yeah. don't feel as happy as if someone gives you money. So that sadness, that's not necessarily depression, right? So it depends on how it affects or how long it lasts. Then, as the person is still struggling with that, maybe there are issues of the people in the home added pressure, you know, unable to meet the, the so you know, demands terms, yeah. of the everyday living. And then, you know, you're already feeling like, okay, I'm not man enough. I'm unable to 
talk, probably people are talking back at me and saying, if people are talking, you're also talking, you know, you when you can't put food on the table. Ah. So it's added assault on the mind. Right. Then you find out that the partner is cheating. So you almost feel completely worthless because you now start to have a, a several thoughts, you know, feeling um, insufficient, feeling I can't even say anything because really, probably the partner has been the one holding the home. So you start to tell yourself a lot of negative things. And that's what depression does. The thoughts become more negative than positive. And that's why as part of treatment, there's something we call you know, cognitive behavior therapy to replace, to try to change the thinking, you know, to replace more of those negative thoughts with positive thoughts, to try to, you know, work on, you know, the psyche of the person. Depending on how severe it is, the person might actually require medication in addition to psychotherapy, which is the talk therapy, you know, to target those thoughts, those negative thoughts. All right, and what about the ones who talked about needing the bedroom scene to get over depression? Okay, good. So the thing is, it's, it's it, okay, that's somebody saying that's the only thing that lifts their mood, isn't mm -hmm. it? So there's a part of the brain actually, you know, referred to as the limbic system, right? So that's the part of the brain that is responsible for what we call reward. So it, it's like rewards the human being. It was created and put there for us to be able to enjoy life. Do you understand? So when you eat your favorite meal, and you, say, and you say things like, this thing is hitting the right spots. It's actually the <laughs> limbic system. Or you take your favorite drink and you feel good. Or you engage in sexual activity and you feel good. It releases, you know, neurotransmitters. Um, the most popular one called dopamine. Dopamine. Yeah, so it lifts the mood. It makes people happy. It makes people excited. So during sexual activity, this happens. So it's possible that when the person is feeling low, the person engages in sexual activity the person feels that rush, you know, that burst of mm. um, elation, you know, for that minute. But if the person now continues this habit, as the case of any time I feel sad, I engage in sexual activity. Every time I feel sad, mm. I engage in... There's actually the possibility of ending up with a sex addiction. Addiction. Do you understand? Because again, are we looking at the reasons the things that are causing the person to the feel low. Causes. Because it's always important to target the root cause. Mm. Do we say that for every time I feel sad, I engage in this activity, for every time I, what if I'm in a place where, or in a situation where I can't do that? Mm. We, so th the person needs, you know, psych evaluation as well to get support, to be able to cope better you know, in a more adaptive way. All right, let's see how we can quickly take some today because some people are calling. And um, don't call, please. I don't call. I see your message. I'm trying to read your messages, but I still see calls coming in. All right, let's take this. Um, okay, let's see. I, um, how can I calm... How can I calm annoyance? All right, I guess the person is always... Anger management. Ang anger management. That's mm. another whole difference. Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, let's... I feel being a good person... In this wicked world is a suicidal mission. Ooh. Take that again. I feel being a good person in this wicked world is a suicidal mission. Oh, so the, I've um, had the worst the person is saying not to be good. Yes, that's, that's what the person is saying, victory. I've had the worst experience meeting with the wrong people in my life, and I feel they only come when they need my help, but I don't get it in return. I'm so stuck at the moment because I can't think of anything else now. Victory is my name. Okay, then just note that another person says, what if you are depressed by your own mom? What would you do? I th okay, I think we mentioned something yeah. about that as we're talking. Let's take this last one. Oh, this one has to do with sleep. Can depression cause someone not to sleep at night? Share yeah. from, from worry. Oh, All right, yeah. so who's so you want to take, take the, from the first one? Okay, That's take from the first one, yeah. Okay, yeah. so um, I'm sorry, what's her name? I'm sorry about your experiences because uh, people... Victory. Pe victory. Mm. So victory, I... You know, I empathize with your experiences. People actually have adverse experiences that can actually begin to change, you know, how they see things. Um, I always try to tell people that there's this, I always try to imagine that I have a mental space, isn't it, that I jealously protect. Yeah. And I preach that everyone should be intentional about that. Protect your mental space. Try to do things that prevent people or you know negative energy from penetrating that space 
Right, because what's happening here is repeated assault. You've probably given a lot of yourself to these people, mm. and over time you've been disappointed, you've been disappointed, you've been disappointed. So maybe what, what you need victory is talking to someone and analyzing those situations on a case-by-case -case basis and seeing how you can modify your own behavior you know, in response to how people treat you. Because it's not our responsibility to change people. Okay, no, you mentioned about always trying to be Do there for good. people. Yes, so and in, then... So in, in a practical, give us a picture, in a practical scenario, what can he do? I mean, now he should want to help and... It's difficult also because journey. I don't know what Victory's experience is. But as a general rule, do you understand? We should always know because we place expectations on others rather than placing expectations on ourselves. It's not our responsibility to change how people behave. It's not my responsibility to change how you behave. It's not your responsibility to change how I behave. My responsibility is to change how I respond to your Okay, let's just understand? leave it at that. We have so many to, so many to take. I think mm -hmm. the, quest, the question about being depressed by one's own mom, I think we've talked, we about, talked about it. We talked about, yeah, yeah toxic so environment, yes. you know, it depends on what the experience So we'll just take, the, we'll react to the one on sleep very, very quickly. Okay, yes, depression actually can cause, you know, what we call insomnia, difficulty in sleeping, initiating or maintaining sleep, or it could call, cause hypersomnia. So just like I talked about the appetite, it could actually reduce the appetite or increase the appetite, the same thing with sleep. Okay. And the same way, insufficient sleep can trigger depression oh. and that's why we preach you know the mantra of good sleep good sleep every adult is expected to have seven to nine hours of adequate sleep <laughs> we should protect our sleep Le you know. I hope you guys heard that she <laughs> said you should have seven to nine hours of sleep well, that means <laughs> it's, it's a peculiar situation it's an environmental factor I know. all right so all right uh, moving on we'll, when we get back we'll just talk very quickly about something or something yeah. some form of depression that is common especially among women we're talking about the postpartum, postpartum depression. depression all right we had a chat with two ladies who came up to actually tell us their postpartum depression story let's have a lesson And I labored for three days. When you labor for three days, it was draining, both mentally, physically, everything. It was draining. We got home. Everyone was congratulating me. Oh, having a V back after CS is not really easy. But then, while well, others were happy for me, I was seeing myself like a totally different person. A lot of things had changed about me. The baby that everyone was expecting me to be so happy to hold and care for. Yes, a part of me was happy, but then a part of me was was feeling like, oh, my body is not really my body. I was just a shadow of myself entirely, and no one was able to understand why I was being that way. Because, you know, a mother that just had a baby should be happy, but the happiness was kind of far from me. After I put to bed, it was a baby girl. Yeah, she came out and she was all right. It was, um, you know, a very, very easy birth, easy delivery. But along the line, there was something I started experiencing. I actually felt detached. You know, one would expect that, you know, after having a child, you should be excited, you should bond easily with a child, you know, you should be over the top, you know, but. At some point, I noticed that excitement phased off. I think that was about two two days, rather two days after delivery. The excitement faded off, and I noticed I was sad. When my baby is with me, I'm just looking at her like, oh, okay, she's beautiful, yes, but can someone just hold this baby? I want to be by myself. And no one is really understanding why I think I should be by myself. They're like, ah, you should spend more time bonding with your baby. You should carry her. You should play with her. But once I just breastfeed, I want to hand her over and just be on my own. I remember one night where she was crying and I just lifted her, looked at her, looked at her. I didn't know what to do. I just dropped her. And my husband was like, what is it? You know, isn't it? At a point, he calmed down. He carried the baby and went to the sitting room and he didn't care. I had anxiety. I was scared that I would die. For some reasons, I was scared that my child would die. 
you know, that fear was there. Each time she's sleeping, I go to check her like 10 times to be sure that she's still breathing. I didn't know why, but that fear was there, right? And then um, I also noticed I couldn't eat. I had insomnia. I couldn't sleep. It was horrible. And this lasted for about roughly three months. Yeah, roughly three months. I, I actually had just my elder sister to talk to. And being that she had not gone through the journey, she also did not understand what was wrong. And my husband, of course, it was actually my disposition as at that time was actually affecting him. Yeah, it was affecting him in the sense that uh, we, were, we, we actually started growing apart. What's supposed to have been a blessing, which is the baby, right? Seemed like it was really putting us apart. You know, it's not actually easy to just come up in front of the camera, in front of everybody, the whole world, and tell your story. But like they would say, it's always good to sometimes share your story. Someone can learn from it. And for some people, it actually helps them in healing. And those are some postpartum stories. I really get to wonder how you're very excited. You're going to put to bed, you're going to have a baby, and the baby comes. And, oh, I don't want the baby. I don't want to touch the baby. The baby puts you off. Anyhow, Dr. Diaba would um, help us um, get to understand that feel. But just before we get to take that question, Let's welcome Michaela Moye. Michaela, thank you very much. Michaela thank was you with for us. having me. Yeah, she was with us last week. She mm. is a caregiver to those uh, with uh, mental health conditions. Michaela, thank you very much for coming and joining us again. Thank you for having me on the show again. You know, when, when, when I get to you now, you're going to first give us a picture of what being a caregiver is. Because, yeah, when you say caregiver, I usually remember our friends abroad who go and many of them do caregiving okay. jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you explain that to us. But uh, that quickly, Dr. Diaba, talk about um, postpartum. Post depression. Okay, yes. I so mean, why would I want my baby? Good. So it's the illness. And it usually, you know, starts in an insidious pattern, like it seeps in gradually. Do you understand? I, a lot of women will tell you that because it's a whole different phase of life, mm. especially if you're a first-time mother. Do you understand? And for obvious reasons, it's only women that have babies, so postpartum depression only affects women. So could there be hormonal factors that come into play? Could there be a genetic predisposition to depression in the first place because not all genetic. women that have babies suffered postpartum depression okay and that's why you know we preach a lot of rest for new mothers because you find out that babies bring a lot of joy everybody wants to see the baby everybody wants to greet the mother everybody has expectations of the mother everybody is giving their own tips oh you need to do this you need to do that forgetting me. that that human body actually just went through one of the most rigorous processes ever. The mm. process of labor and bringing forth, you know, life. So they sleep less because now there's another life they're responsible for, the midnight feeds, you know, and all that stress. So additional stress on the mind and getting their body back. So over time, the stress, assault on the brain, then they start to feel low, they start to feel exasperated, they start to feel overwhelmed. Do you understand? And you start hearing things like, I just don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to greet anyone. So social withdrawal. They're losing interest in the baby. And then if they're surrounded by people who do not understand it as well, they're blamed again. Oh, she doesn't mean well. Oh, she's a, you know, she's, a, she's evil. Yeah, How can a mother not that, like yes. the baby? Again, there are two different um conditions because it could be depression it could be puperal psychosis so when we're Stay talking of psychosis English. psychosis means you know there are there's a distortion in the thought process they're beginning to either hear voices you know those are the ones that are actually trying to even harm the baby or kill the Ooh. baby or so it's getting more severe right so i think the learning here is people should understand that new mothers need a lot of support and there is something called postpartum depression that needs medical care, clinical care, yeah, the partners because so. yes, we've gotten to a stage where you hear people normalizing this, they tell you things like that's how motherhood is. Mm. Once you become a mother, you don't sleep, but you go, you know, some, some, some 
centers you deliver, they actually come to take the baby away from you, so you tell you that do you want for how long do you want to stay? Do you want to rest? So two hours will take the baby to the nursery and you rest because mm. they understand the need for that rest. Okay, postpartum depression. I think postpartum is a whole different. Yeah. That's a whole day work for, uh, on its own. I, I want today to be as much, many of these messages yeah. as possible. And um, this person is asking mental depression. Uh, okay, no, this. Oh, this, there's a question I wanted you to take, the, uh, Michaela. Okay. It is uh, what's the difference between a doctor and if a person says a first aider, but you say you're not a first aider, you mm, are caregiver. a caregiver. So, mm. what's the difference between she and uh, yeah well i think i understand the doctor is on that treat yes. you what do you do well so a caregiver basically makes sure that the person that they're caring for is safe is secure and is comfortable and is stable so no matter the kind of caregiving if it's just physical or if it's physical and um, psychological the person has to be stable comfortable and secure um, and there are all kinds of tasks that are related to this also depending on how um, how severe or how mild the symptoms of the person who is being uh, who is receiving care how mild or um, the symptoms are do as a person do you have to be always available always present it, it really depends um, so for example um, I go to work I work in nine to five oh, um, okay. I'm here. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, the person I take care of is fully functional. He can, you know, he takes care of himself. They take care of themselves. Um, they cook, lead a basically normal life, right? So basically depends normal on the life. needs, the daily needs Ex of the person. Exactly. So it depends on the daily needs of the person. Some people need constant attention, yeah. constant care. And some people will develop you know the symptoms the change mm -hmm. people could start out needing almost 24 7 surveillance and after a while that would develop into maybe just needing someone to check in on them once a week mm -hmm. or once a day it really really depends so the responsibilities of a caregiver the some basic responsibilities but they really vary um mm -hmm. it's very wide and it's all dependent on the person who is receiving care yeah, and I mm. think it depends on how functional the person is. That's yes, what you're saying. Exactly. So some people are fully dependent, some people are semi-dependent. So mm. the task of the caregiver would depend on how much exactly the on needs how much the support person the person is. requires. Yes. Mm. Okay, well then, but there is a first aider. Mm. Okay, so they're psychological first aiders. Mm -hmm. So they, you know, they're trained to be able to, uh, you know, the way you have first aid. So if there's an accident by the side of the road, right. it's the first yes. aider that does the first level care. So imagine a situation where maybe there's trauma, maybe there's a raid, maybe a neighborhood armed robbery or something. So a mental health first aider can actually do and do the initial crisis intervention, you know, talk to the person, de-escalate the chaos, and then be able to do a form of triage to say, okay, I've spoken to this ones, this ones need a higher level care, and then they sign post and they refer. So okay. it's the same thing. Um We'll take the next report now. When we go on this break, I will run through many of these questions yeah, so that we can we'll take them back to back as soon as we get yeah. back for this report. Now, this report is one of the ones we actually featured last week, and it was quite interesting. It has to do with uh, those in the entertainment industry who have gone through one depression or another, just for us to, you know, have a feel of it. In a 2015 survey by Stage, Equity and Spotlight, one in five people working in entertainment have actually sought help for their mental health. But this figure may well underestimate the true extent of the problems in the sector. In September 2018, singer Ari Song shocked fans with an Instagram post stating, Don't cry when I die. Celebrate. Put up a Kingmaker concert. I have lived. I have done my beat. Carry on in grace. About 22 hours later, his manager stated that Ari Song was dealing with slight emotional issues and he had booked a session with an emotional intelligence coach. In 2021, 
Golaon Ololade, also known as KV, withdrew from Big Brother Niger barely a week into the show on medical grounds. I'm bonding so well. They are good people. Um, they have been so friendly, generous as well, as well. He later explained it was because he had a mental breakdown. In a statement, KV says he underestimated the effect isolation would have on his mental health and integrating with other housemates. Also in Nigeria, the likes of Tonto DK, T-Bills, Tony Abraham and Inyaya have all experienced a form of mental illness. In the case of Hollywood star Robin Williams and legendary fashion designer Alexander McQueen, they lost the battle to depression by taking their lives. Robin Williams brought some of the most magical movie experiences, while Alexander McQueen is a globally acclaimed brand. But mental illness is no respecter of fame or status. There are music stars who have been depressed and considered quitting because of a bad reception of their music album. The stress of a world tour got to Canadian singer Shawn Mendes as he cancelled his tour to focus on his mental health. Justin Bieber in his YouTube docu-series Seasons gave fans an inside look at his struggles with addiction and mental health challenges. I was a good kid but I was still like a shithead. I was bad in school, I was always a class clown, I never really respected authority like that. The stigma around mental health can make one hide their pain and try to deal with things behind closed doors. While many famous people have decided to come forward and be transparent about their mental health struggles, discussing the issue does not always mean that you can overcome it. Some of these famous stars have survived it, while others did not. Madam. Monkey, I know they for the village where I will go by him. Eh? Yes. So now you won't go down. I'm not know what you said. I'm with them. I carry some money. Ah, boy! The, the shocking death is of actress Adame, popular for her role as Emu Johnson in African magic television series The Johnsons, has brought about lots of questions. She revealed on a television show that she was suffering max depression even before her daughter's death. These entertainers make every effort to put a smile on the faces of their fans through their creative works. But beneath that smile or joy could be a troubling personality who is dealing with life. They are in the business of de-stressing you and keeping you entertained. Are you the source of their worry? Do you troll them for fun? You just may want to remember that they are just as vulnerable as everyone else. Okay, all right, if you just join us, the program is The Medley Show on the Nigerian Television Authority, and we are taking a look at depression on the program today. Our, f our phone line is 081-177-82020. Managing your mental health is our focus today. All right, um, I said when we get back from that break, we will be taking as many messages as possible so and i still have with me uh michaela monye she is a caregiver and of course dr diab bashwaibu she is a mental health physician now there's this question i would like us to take a look at uh, very quickly okay as many as possible hello doctor i feel depressed and lonely sometimes i feel like lashing out on my daughter or beating her and sometimes i feel like crying and shouting out uh shouting out I feel unloved. I need help, please. Can you touch on that yeah, very so, quickly? Yeah, irritability. Okay. Can be the first sign of depression. Okay, maybe we'll just add the person who talked about mood swing. Someone else is talking about mood swing here. Yeah, I'm depression is a mood disorder. Okay. So we should be mindful of that. It falls under the category of mood disorder. So the fact that you're even feeling low, you know, already points towards a mood issue. Right. So the mood swing, of course, we need to know how much, how far apart the swings are because because I said it's a mood disorder could it be bipolar that means is the person swinging from very low mood to very elated mood or is the person just swinging from I feel good now I'm low I feel good remember the depre the definition I gave of depression is a feeling uh, you know persistent low mood for most part of the day every day for at least two weeks 
So does that mean for most part of the day I'm low, but at some point in the day I come back normal? So is that what she's referring to as mood swings? Back to the irritability, it could be one of the early signs. So you find out that you're lashing out at everyone, you're feeling very irritated, you know, um, you don't even just, you just want to be alone. Mm. Weepy spells is also a core feature of depression. So people cry more often than usual. You know, you find yourself crying a lot, you're telling yourself a lot of things. Sometimes you're just talking to people and then you break down in, te in tears. It's a future of depression as well. So this person sounds like someone who's struggling with symptoms of a low mood, which is depression. But of course, further evaluation is important, like I said. You need to ask questions to see that the person meets the criteria before you assign a diagnosis. a diagnosis. So that's why that's the importance of seeing a professional. Because you know with mental health issues, we're afraid of labels. Yes, you know, well we have to normalize seeing a, uh, a practitioner yeah. because yes, yeah, some to say, I want to go and say, I want to go and say a psychiatrist. Hey, says you don't cry, so <laughs> you know that's really the thing. All right, um, I know you've talked about words, uh, using kind words. I know yeah, that's when you have that your wall of hope thing, yeah. mm -hmm. words of affirmation. Michael, how does that work? Well, uh, for everyone involved, I understand that it can be challenging, um, whether for caregivers or for you know just family and friends of yeah. a person who is living with a mental illness, it can be challenging because generally Nigerians, we're very jocular and, and we, we, we make it. jokes about things that might be considered insensitive, you know, in, in other climes. So it will take a lot of work, but it's something that we can do. We can be, we can be mindful of our words. Um, personally, I use affirmations for myself. I tell myself yes. positive things and I try to use that to calm myself when I then have to um, be involved in my caregiving duties mm. because they in themselves can be very challenging. That's mm. right. Yes. Okay. So positive words of affirmation. Um, do things like watch comedies. When I find myself, self care, isn't yes, it? Self care. Okay, because yeah, like you said last week, you have to care for yourself. Exactly. Care give up to be mm. cared for. Okay. Exactly. Um, I let's take many more questions. Okay. Now, let me try to group a couple of these together. And uh, some of these questions have to do with someone is talking about a lady he wants to get married to. He really loves her, but she's going out with other married men. But he's still very much emotionally involved with her. Mm. What does he do? And he's feeling depressed about it. Someone else is saying that he loves someone who doesn't seem to love him back. But um, yeah, but he just cannot let go. And mm. every time he feels depressed about it, can we just marry those two together? So I think is the issue of you know matters of the heart. You know, it's very easy to tell someone to, of course, things that make us happy. You know, you have a good relationship, you're happy with someone, you're in love, it lifts, lifts the mood, isn't it? And if it's the other way, the mood just goes down. Mm -hmm. So I think number one thing for people to note is the issue of self-love and self-care, mm -hmm. right? Because you need to understand that being in a relationship should add to you and not take away from you, isn't it? So first of all, it's n don't place that responsibility of being happy on someone else. It is your responsibility. Do the things you enjoy. Do the things that make you happy. Such that if you're now in a relationship, it's supposed to add to that. Such that if anything happens to that relationship, it takes away that addition, but the baseline remains. Mm -hmm. But if this thing is already taken away from whatever you have as your reserve, mm -hmm. then you, you, you might need to reconsider it and look at it. Okay. Do you understand? I, I think that um, one good thing that we can also do in these kinds of situations is just to manage our expectations. You know, what have expectations first of all of what you want coming out of this romantic relationship, and then manage those expectations because how you feel in your mind or in your soul or whatever is not the same way another person is going to feel, even if that person is your intended or your spouse. You mm. know. So manage your expectations of other people mm. and, you know, like she said, take care of yourself so that if things don't work out and if you see things are okay. not working out, then be brave enough to... Okay, yeah, you should be able to guide your own speech. Yes, because, you know, you, you, I'm sure you get a lot of 
comments on oh financial i'm broke so i'm depressed i'm you know in a relationship i'm depressed um you know mm -hmm. there's something called you know the dimensions of wellness we need to nurture ourselves when we're well before we tilt to the illness side okay um i have, <laughs> I have to go now i have messages on many of these uh, someone talked about always being depressed whenever he's going home to go and meet his uh, partner Social at wellness. home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some are talking about disappointment in marriages, some are talking about Social job. Um, Occupational whoo. wellness. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just so many. I see your messages on text, text message and on WhatsApp. Uh, I think um, as much as possible, we've answered many of your questions as possible. But if there are some specific ones that I need to direct to Dr. Diaba, Oh, Michaela, I will do so. Yeah. So thank you very much for being part of the program. Michaela, I thank you very much for coming around again. You thank have to you teach us how much. to be a uh, caregiver. <laughs> Everyone should be a caregiver That's right. somehow. somehow. Even if it's for themselves. Eh? Even if it's, <laughs> yeah, even if it's for yourself. <laughs> Dr. Diaba, always nice to have you. Thank you. All right. Love thank you very much. And for me, thing. I want to say always stay safe, take care of yourself. And that <laughs> is very, very important. My name is Cecil, signing out. <laughs>